Good afternoon, everybody. Here with the Paul and Josh and Angela Wong. Angela is at Pfizer, a leading uh, expert on vaccines, uh, can give us the update on um, incredible news regarding vaccines that comes out every week now. Uh, so let me just go quickly through our COVID uh, daily summary. I think what you can see here um, is a couple of things. One, we continue to do a lot of testing, a lot more than our peers. That'll be relevant in a second. The positivity rate, 4.45%. It's been about 37 over the last seven days, a relatively steady. Uh, current hospitalizations down 21. That's uh, good news. Uh, fatalities uh, up 14, but still um, averaging about five a day over the last uh, week or two. So obviously we're going to talk about fatalities here in a second, what that says about our vaccination program. This chart is not necessarily a chart you want to be on, uh, but these are 10 states during the last uh, week. In terms of uh, cases per capita, this is the number of cases um, COVID-related uh, positivity that you have. You can see on the left-hand side that it's really related to Michigan and uh, the Northeast. And you can see we're right in the center there next to New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. Um, a little bit interesting. You say, okay, there's probably a geographic footprint to this, probably a little bit of seasonality. Uh, as I look at the chart, it's a little uh, unnerving to see um, uh, the positivity kind of going up Metro North again, a little similar to where we were uh, exactly a year ago. It's also worth noting that in those groups, those states in the Northeast that have uh, the highest positivity, top 10 in the country, um, some of them are at 50% capacity, some of them are at 100% capacity, some have a curfew, others don't, some close bars, some open. So it gives you an idea that some, there are some bigger factors at work. The other chart is um, fatalities, deaths per capita. And it's sort of interesting to see how that's not necessarily directly related to cases per capita. Um, and I think that's because of different vaccination strategies in part. So, for example, you can see that, um, well, Connecticut um, is in the top 10 in terms of cases per capita. I, as I always like to add, we do about 10 times more testing than the South. So, but still, we, we have a high positivity, but we're one of the lowest in the country, number 35 to be exact, when it comes to fatalities per capita. So it's just a reminder, I think, that vaccinating folks who are most at risk, vaccinating those who are most likely to suffer uh, complications or death made a big difference in terms of uh, uh, where, we, where we are in that chart. So I think that was worth remembering, and it's worth showing that vaccinations work. The vaccine update, um, this is what's interesting. First of all, everybody is now available uh, 16 and over, and uh, we made 100,000 appointments today. Uh, I know that many of you are there at 12.01 in the morning and hitting that refresh button. Um, be a little bit patient, but uh, right now the vaccine flow is still continuing. I know you heard about a hiccup at Johnson & Johnson. That's not impacting Connecticut. We didn't have any supply from them. We got our supply for this week. We have our supply for next week. 81% um, of those uh, 65 and above um, have now uh, had their uh, doses. That, that's number three in the nation. That makes a big difference. Um, and 43% overall have had at least their first dose. 43% of 16 and above. So we're making very good progress on that front. And I think it, it's uh, being reflected in hospitalizations and fatalities. Look, let me just, as a lead into introducing you to Angela, just a little bit of uh, good news that I can uh, steal her thunder. Sorry about that. Uh, number one, it's worth noting that um, Pfizer and their partner, uh, BioNTech, um, have done some preliminary testing and found that the vaccines are working for a younger demographic. Right now, only Pfizer has been approved for 16 to 18 year olds, and we're gonna be targeting Pfizer for the high school college population. And now preliminary testing is showing it's safe for 12 to 15. That's really important as we broaden the reach of our vaccines and make sure more people uh, you know, are immune. And secondly, um, it's highly effective uh, for, uh, for at least six months. Uh, we may be taking booster shots and the such going forward in the future, but I think this is good news that it's working. 
and that it's working on a wider variety of uh, contexts. Angela, what does this mean to us? Well, thank you, Governor Lamont, and I'm really honored to be uh, joining you t today and having this opportunity to talk to all of you about our vaccine. Um, but before I begin, as you know, I am a longtime resident of Connecticut, and my husband and I have raised both our kids here, and our family has created strong roots in this community. So I, first of all, I want to thank you and commend you for your leadership in managing this pandemic. And just from the outset, you provided the structure clear direction, resources, and care. And whether it was about testing or guidance on social distancing, and now uh, just the charts that you've reviewed, the vaccine distribution, it's been really tremendous. And so from the bottom of my heart and as a Connecticut resident, thank you. But for us here at Pfizer, we're proud to have a very strong and well-established footprint in Connecticut. And we celebrate the role that Connecticut Bioscience has played in actually helping us to develop and distribute, distribute this vaccine. In fact, our Groton R&D site is the largest in our research and development network. And more recently, it played a really pivotal role in the manufacture of the COVID-19 vaccine through its work in manufacturing lipids. These lipids, which are used to make the vaccine, were made in Groton, and the lipids that were made in Groton have contributed to over 100 million doses of the vaccine. And even though today we have a safe and effective vaccine, we know that there's so much more work to do to explore the full potential of this therapy. And this is where science and R&D continues to lead us. We're looking at expanding age groups, as well as understanding the duration of protection for the vaccine, as well as building a, comprehens a comprehensive set of knowledge and tools to help bring this pandemic to an end. And as you just saw this very week, with our partner BioNTech, we shared two exciting pieces of new data. On Monday, we shared results from a study of adolescents ages 12 to 15, where we saw a 100% vaccine efficacy. This is really exciting and a potential step towards vaccinating this age group and hopefully getting our kids back to school in the fall. And then this morning, we announced updated top line data from our landmark COVID-19 vaccine study that demonstrated vaccine effectiveness against the COVID-19 at 91.3%, seven days through to six months after the second dose. And if you look at the CDC's definition of preventing severe disease, the vaccine was found to be 100% effective. And if you look at the FDA's definition, the vaccine was found to be 95.3% effective. And we've also heard a lot about the emergence of variants. And we're happy to share that our vaccine was found to be 100% effective in preventing COVID-19 cases in the South African variant. So this is all very promising. And for us at Pfizer, we believe that science will win and that we will continue to gather more evidence on the safety and efficacy of the vaccine for all important populations. So my hope is that this year, we'll put a lot of this behind us. While we won't be in a crisis forever, it is also clear that rigorous surveillance and continued responsible public health measures, as well as getting vaccinated, remains critical. So Governor Lamont, you can count on Pfizer to continue to work closely with you and governments around the world to ensure the continued delivery of our vaccine. And rest assured that we will leave no stone unturned in the fight against COVID-19 today, as well as in the future. We're lucky to have you here, Angela and Pfizer. Thank you for that. Let me ask you the first question then. Um, you're working against the Brazilian, you work against the UK, there's gonna be a myriad of other variants as years go on. Does the mRNA um, methodology give you a little more flexibility to respond to these variants as they come along? It absolutely does. Um, the beauty of the mRNA technology is that um, once you have the genetic sequence of the virus, you can quickly make it and in a very short order be able to produce a new vaccine. And, um, and so we feel very confident that this technology platform that we have developed gives us options, right? The first option is that, as you've seen today in the data, we could just vaccinate and boost with the same vaccine that we have today, keep a very high level of um, immunogenicity in our bodies. And that is the mechanism by which we could manage the new variants. 
or if needed, we could make a vaccine, another vaccine. And uh, we've actually estimated that we'll be able to make a new vaccine in about 116 days, um, subject to obviously regulatory approval. So whichever way this goes, I think we can be rest assured that uh, we have options and we have solutions that will enable us um, to, uh, to really uh, meet the needs and uh, be able to respond to however this virus emerges and changes um, through time. Well, thank you. Um, Angela's got to go innovate in about 10 or 15 minutes, 10 minutes, but we've got a time for a few questions uh, as needed. Uh, yes, Angela Wong will have to leave at approximately 4.30, so putting that out there for our reporters. Channel 3, Eyewitness News. Uh, yes, a question for Ms. Wong. Um, you know, we know that the vaccine efficacy is around six months. So, you know, what's the process going for to determine how often we may need to get this shot? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, we are doing a study um, to understand, um, you know, the effects of boosting. Uh, and when you boost, whether it's uh, from six months to 12 months, you know, what that looks like. Um, so I think, you know, what we, what we know today is that we have a highly effective vaccine that is safe, that, it, um, that the duration of protection as we know it is, is to six months today. And I think that this next study will help us to understand, you know, what, what are the time intervals by which you need to boost at six months or at 12 months. Uh, but I think the key important thing to remember is that with the variants that we have seen um, that are really quite prevalent in the world now, um, the need to boost is in our reality. And so um, it'll just be a matter of figuring out which, at which time intervals that is. Got it. Thank you. And, and Governor, a real quick question for you. Um, the, the chart that you just showed shows that the state expects supply to exceed demand by late April. So is there going to be a point where you say, all right, you know, we've given people enough time to have the opportunity to get vaccinated and we're going to reopen the state fully? I mean, maybe the mask mandate will still be in place, but no social distancing to the point where businesses can have what was full capacity again. Not for a while. Um, you're right. Uh, we're, we're going to have very good capacity in our vaccines in a, a month, six weeks. Um, I'd like to see the demand pick up. I'd like to get us uh, close to herd immunity. Well, thanks to Fivers, we'll probably be able to start vaccinating younger people over a period of time. Uh, but that doesn't mean um, there still won't be variants and risks out there. So I'd probably err on the side of caution a little bit longer than that, Matt. Thank you. Fox 61. Hi, my first question would be for Angela. Could you talk a little bit about this study done on the individuals between the ages of 12 to 15? Was it used the same exact vaccine that is given to individuals that are 16 and older? Yes. Um, so we ran a, um, the clinical trials were conducted in the same way that they were conducted for all the other age groups. We had a placebo, a placebo group and then we had a test group. And, um, in the, uh, and the test group received the exact, same, um, the same exact same vaccine at the exact same schedule. So um, at day zero and at day 21. And then my next question is for the governor. You mentioned that the Johnson & Johnson incident with the manufacturing issues, it will not have an effect on Connecticut supply, um, that you received the shipments promise, but what would have happened if something like this did affect the state's COVID vaccine supply coming from Johnson & Johnson? Well, I'll start, but um, probably Angela should answer that question better than I. The good news is none of our J&J &J supply came from that particular facility. The good news is we got our dose for this week. We've got our dose for next week uh, all on track. Um, I think we would have detected things, but Angela or Josh, do you have some insights on how we would have detected that? I mean, you know, just speaking from a Pfizer perspective, I don't have any insights into, uh, you know, what happened in this particular incident um, with, uh, with the J&J &J vaccine. But maybe what I can do is pr to provide some assurance from my end, um, which is that, you know, from, from the time we started making this vaccine, uh, what we've seen is tremendous um, improvements 
improvements from a process perspective, improvements from a capacity perspective, improvements from a liquid production perspective, which is a, a critical ingredient to making this vaccine, which is why Groton was so critical, um, you know, in this um, in this journey of ours. Um, but you know, we've we've raised our, our production um, numbers um, at least two or three times already. We started at. 1.3 billion, then we went up to 2 billion, and our latest estimate for the world now is 2.5 billion. Um, so, you know, we are feeling uh, very confident about the infrastructure and the process that we have developed for manufacturing um, this dose, and we will be able to step up to whatever doses are required, um, you know, if, if that's what is needed. Yeah, and I, and I would only add, I think the, the Johnson & Johnson example is, is actually um, should give people a lot of confidence in the fact that the, the processes in place in the United States for quality assurance and, and quality control around pharmaceuticals and vaccine manufacturing and production are the best in the world. And so there are multiple checks in the process designed to catch uh, defects in the manufacturing process. My prior life, uh, our software company served uh, biopharmaceutical companies, including Pfizer. And so we know very well how rigorous the standards are. And I think this is just an example of those standards working perfectly well. Um, and as the governor said, fortunately for, for us, we'll still get our J&J &J doses from a different manufacturing facility for next week. Uh, beyond that, we have a little less clarity in terms of uh, how this plays through, but at least for the short term, when we have far more demand and supply still, particularly as we open up to the rest of the state today, you know, we'll be well positioned to keep vaccinating very quickly uh, this week and next week at least. Thank you. NBC Connecticut. Good afternoon, Governor Matt Austin with NBC Connecticut. My first question is just to Angela, just in terms of opening up the Pfizer vaccine to this younger demographic, do you have any expectation of how soon it could be authorized for that use? Thanks for the question, Matt. Um, so per all of our, our, you know, the standard procedures that we would have, we are now taking this data and we will be submitting it to the FDA. The FDA will then take the opportunity to review the data. They will consult with um, the CDC and much like what you saw in December, um, the CDC and the FDA will provide their, um, their um, well, the CDC provides their recommendation, the FDA then applies the approval. And so um, we hope, you know, that over the next, um, you know, the next several weeks or so, uh, we'll be able to see some of this come to pass and that will then uh, lead us to the, uh, the authorization. So that's the those are the anticipated steps right now. Gotcha. And I just know, you know, for a lot of parents, um, the decision whether to vaccinate their kids or not can be, you know, very difficult and emotional. What would you want them to know um, about the vaccine and if, when they consider, you know, um, vaccinating their own child? No, that's a great question because I think that um, there are just so many questions out there right now around um, just knowledge of the vaccine and vaccine confidence. Um, and what I can share is that this is a vaccine that has been tested rigorously. It was tested in 44,000 um, people 18 years and older. And more recently with this study, another 4,000 um, individuals 12 to 15 years of age. And that's just in a clinical trial. Um, in addition to that, this vaccine has now been administered to close to 90 million people around the world. And uh, so we have real world data um, that accompany the clinical trial data that we've seen. And so amongst these 90 million people that we've vaccinated, we have not seen um, any, you know, any adverse events that were um, different from what we saw in the clinical trial. So the consistency of what we've seen from both an efficacy as well as a safety perspective has been repeated over and over again. And so, um, so I think my message to everyone, um, you know, whether it's uh, whether it's the younger, the, the adolescent, or or the older population, the 18 plus, or the more recently, um, you know, the the recent the data that we're seeing on the 12 to 15, is that this vaccine is um, is safe, is effective. And it was deemed to be so not only by the FDA, but by all regulatory agencies around the world. Thank you, Angela. And Governor, just going back to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, I know you were talking about at least the state supply this week and next week seems secure, but going beyond that, there are some question marks. Can you say how that might um, potentially impact some of the equity programs, which I believe we're really going to rely on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine? Uh, I believe the Johnson Johnson is going to, uh, you know, 
ramp up and, and be able to get uh, the doses we need. There may be a week delay, something like that. Uh, but you're absolutely right, Matt. Um, the single dose is a lot easier uh, to uh, monitor and minister for uh, many communities, um, especially when we're going in with a mobile van and uh, finding people, some of whom are uh, able to walk up in the very near future. But in the meantime, uh, the Pfizer and Moderna, um, we're going to be able to uh, work in those same communities with that as well. So I'd like to think we're not going to miss a beat. Okay, thank you. News 8. For both the governor and, uh, and Josh, uh, understanding that today is just the first day um, with 16 and over, but is there anything in the early going here that um, you can tell us about how you would characterize what you've heard from people at some of the sites and what you expected and, and uh, how has it been for, the, for this demographic? I'll start. I think uh, a lot of uh, folks um, in this 16 to 45 were really looking forward to this day and what it meant. Uh, Paul was uh, describing what he saw on social media, taking pe people taking pictures of themselves, feeling liberated. Uh, uh, this is a demographic that's been waiting, um, you know, a couple of months now for their opportunity, and I think it made them smile. Yeah, I think on a, on a day like this, uh the, the news is the news that we don't make, right, um, which is things going generally smoothly. Uh, we know there's some people out there who are frustrated who haven't been able to find an appointment yet. As we have warned, every time we open up a new phase, there's a lot more people looking to book appointments than we have vaccines in that week. But um, with the continued supply over the next couple of weeks, all of our providers are constantly adding new appointment slots. Uh, we, we remain confident that everybody who's uh, looking for a vaccine today, even if they haven't been able to find an appointment, will be able to find one within the next two to three weeks. So please be patient and hang in there. But uh, we, we believe over 100,000 people uh, booked appointments today as, as the new eligibility expanded. Uh, so that's a good start. And uh, we'll keep going uh, through the next couple of weeks until everyone uh, has that opportunity. And Governor, just to switch gears a little bit, something that we've we've heard about, and I think a couple of uh, sports venues, NBA franchises, have begun uh, with their fans asking for a vaccine, either a passport or you know something to, to prove. Um, where do you stand on the idea of a COVID-19 vaccine passport for Connecticut residents, and, in, and especially in terms of possible privacy implications? Yeah, I think it's a little premature. We just opened to the um, youngest demographic now. Let's uh, give it uh, six weeks. Let's get everybody an opportunity to get vaccinated. But you're right. If you want to go to Madison Square Garden, um, if you want to go on a JetBlue flight, they say, I want to see proof that you've been tested or, um, or vaccinated. And uh, whether you see that moving into our sports venues, you see that moving into restaurants and stores, I think – the private sector will probably take the lead there, um, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. News 12, Connecticut. Good afternoon, Governor Lamont. A uh, question for you is now that the floodgates are open to thousands of people, like you guys said, 100,000 people have made appointments today. Is it a concern that people with underlying conditions that are not prioritized are going up against healthy individuals to find appointments? Well, as you know, um, the majority of those folks were in the 45 and above age group, so they've all had their opportunity to get vaccinated. We did prioritize uh, a number of conditions. They're in the fast lane, so to speak. We did that in association with our hospital administrators. And so I'd like to say to um, others who maybe feel like they're more vulnerable, um, it's now available to you, and I think your doctors, medical community, do everything we can to make sure you get vaccinated on a timely basis. I know for the um, intellectual disabilities, uh, we're making a special effort there to get um, thousands of people vaccinated on a priority basis over the course of the next uh, 10 days. The Associated Press. Uh, thank you, Max. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Ms. Wong, you said that rigorous surveillance and public health measures will still be needed. Um, what would you think that would entail? Uh, should we be seeing a mask mandate for years to come, months to come? And also, when will we learn more about when or if we'll need a booster? Yeah. So our, um, our booster trials are, um, are you know, actively in motion. 
And so I would say by the summer, we'll have a much greater sense and a much better sense of what that looks like and the time intervals um, that I talked about earlier um, by which we would need to, uh, to boost and what that would look like. Um, so I think over the next several months, we'll be able to learn more. Um, I think my comment more broadly around surveillance is that for us as a pharmaceutical company, um, surveillance is going to be really important, right? Because we need to continue to monitor um, these variants, the emergence of variants, are there new variants? Um, how many mutations do they have? How different are they um, as they, you know, as they continue to um, as they continue to change? So, um, so that we can stay on top of um, what our needs are in terms of providing a solution. Um, and then I think good public health measures, especially in this moment in time, is going to be really important. Um, as Governor Lamont said, just here in Connecticut, we have 40, just over 40 percent of our population vaccinated, which means that 60 percent of them are not. And until we get to a place where um, the majority of people are vaccinated so that we can build herd immunity outbreaks, and um, and you know places of in, uh, of of infection can continue to uh, to emerge, and so that's why you know the surveillance on my part, but just um, good public health behaviors on all of our parts are going to be important until we get to that place where we achieve herd immunity. Oh, thank you, and and Governor, has any thought been given to increasing the uh, vaccination slots for people that have? that want to drive through appointment. I've heard from someone with a compromised immune system who was on the phone, the vaccine assistance line today for about four hours before being dropped off. Um, so is there any thought about maybe setting up a special phone line or a website just for people that really need drive up appointments because they're, they just can't go inside a pharmacy? Um, as you know, Sue, we're, We've got the mobile vans. We're uh, taking the vaccines to people wherever we can. I think you're right. I think that we ought to have a, a special line. We're telephoning out thousands of calls every week now trying to find these people through the hospitals. They're making the same uh, outreach to people as well. Um, uh, we're trying to find those who are the most vulnerable. I mean, I, I'm sort of interested that the uh, Connecticut Children's Hospital, all those kids are going to get vaccinated over the course of the next week. So we are really trying to find those people that need it, and make sure they get their vaccine. Are there any thoughts, though, of maybe increasing the number of drive-through vaccination sites? Um, I think the mobile van handles some of that. I know that we're um, having a 24-hour vaxathon next week where people will be able to come in and by appointment and get, and get vaccinated easier. Um, I'll have to figure out, think a little more about the drive-through site. Josh, maybe you have some insights there. Yeah, no, it, it's, a, it's a, uh, a request that we've heard a few times. I mean, I think just as a reminder to people, the, the largest single vaccination site in the state uh, is the Pratt & Whitney runway is a drive-through site. So if you're searching, that's a good place to look that a lot of vaccine comes through there. Um, but we've also um, uh, put a filter on the state website. So if you go on COVID, COVID.gov, sorry, ct.gov slash COVID vaccine, you put in your zip code and it shows you the list of uh, vaccine sites that are closest to you. You'll see there's a little check mark you can put on there that um, where you can uh, uh, filter against sites that are drive through or not. So that can help you also identify sites um, if you're just looking for a, a drive through location. Um, so hopefully those are those resources are helpful. Okay, great. Thank you very much, everyone. We'd like to thank uh, Angela Wong from Pfizer for joining us. Uh, she uh, does have to leave. So well, once again, we'd like to thank her and Pfizer for her participation today. Thanks, Angela. Thanks, well, Governor Lamont. And um, thank you for having me here today. See you soon. Bye. We'll move along next to WTIC 1080 News. Hi. As far as the vans go, when, when are we going to start to see those 35 vans head out? I think we're going to see those 35 yellow vans heading out, uh, you know, within a week or so, if I have that about right. There are yellow vans. They each have about 150 doses there. And um, pretty soon, um, you know, you'll be able to walk up like it's the ice cream truck and get a vaccination. Right now, it's still by appointment, but we're getting there. CT News Junkie. 
Thanks, Max. Um, Josh or the governor, uh, I, I asked about this a few weeks back, but I was wondering if there's any plans to uh, when we might have, now that there's vac everyone's sort of eligible to get a vaccine, when state employees might be asked to come back into the office. I understand that some of the businesses in Hartford are kind of hurting because a lot of those folks who used to be in the area uh, uh, and, and using those businesses are no longer. Josh? We're going to we're going to continue to follow the the public health guidance, uh, same as what's recommended for all you know office based employees. Um, you know, a significant portion of state employees, of course, have been working every day on site in critical um, frontline essential roles throughout this pandemic. So we don't want to lose track of them. But for the people who are office based, um, our expectation of all of our agencies is that they're fully productive right now. Um, and until we have you know, everyone vaccinated and COVID really in the rearview mirror. Um, you know, the governor and Commissioner Gifford continue to urge caution around, you know, pouring back into office buildings until we, you know, make sure we've got it uh, well under control. So we'll continue to follow the same guidance uh, that, you know, are being provided from a public health perspective for, uh, you know, all uh, office space workers. So you would say that there's no immediate plans for that until we achieve something like the, the herd immunity that Ms. Wong was just describing? We're going to keep taking it, you know, kind of week by week, month by month, based on uh, what the public health guidance is. I mean, there's there's people in our office buildings every day right now, um, and but there's also still a lot of people telecommuting, which until we really have COVID behind us is uh, is probably prudent. Okay. Um, do you have any updates on the IDD um, clinics? I guess you guys were going to hold some on Friday. Yeah, first first two tomorrow. Um, really excited about this. Compliments to uh, Commissioner Chef uh, and his uh, team, Katie Rock Burns over there, doing an amazing job. So first clinics tomorrow, one in Torrington, one in Trumbull. Um, about 1,000 people signed up uh, to be vaccinated. Uh, and another, uh, I believe, 17 clinics over the next two weeks were scheduled. Outreach has been done uh, to uh, all uh everyone in the DSS network, uh, all you know, uh, individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities across the state, about half of whom have already been vaccinated because uh, they may live in a, in a um, congregate uh, setting uh, where we prioritized vaccinations back in January. Um, but that's uh, well underway and really excited about that. Okay. Uh, Governor, I guess you have proposed a, um, let's see, uh, the CBI is describing it as a tax uh, to, on health insurance. Uh, they're saying some of those costs may be passed on to consumers. I yeah, if you that's might. Uh, absolutely wrong. There, there was a federal tax, which 90% uh, of that's going to go away. The last of it we're going to use in order to help subsidize the people in the exchange. Um, as you know, the rescue plan offers extraordinary subsidies for people earning up to seventy, seventy-five thousand dollars $75,000, bringing down the uh, monthly cost of um, health insurance on the exchange dramatically. But it doesn't help those folks who have a high deductible or a copay. That's what we'd like to do uh, with our um, the fee that we're going to put in place. It's a reduction in the hospital tax they got now, but we're not reducing all of that federal tax. And that's going to allow a lot more people to be able to afford health insurance, not only be able to afford it, but afford to use it. And that's what matters. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Hearst, Connecticut Media. Thanks. Um, either for the governor or Josh, can you describe in a little bit more detail how we're going to get to supply exceeding demand at the end of the month, what, what the projections are going to look like in the coming weeks? I'll start. Um, we uh, work uh, every week with the COVID task force down in Washington, D.C. They give us a pretty good three-week window in terms of what the supply of vaccine looks like. Obviously, the J&J &J has ramped up a lot. The Pfizer is ramping up a, a fair amount. So we had a good window. Obviously, there's a bit of a hiccup when it comes to the J&J. &J, but uh, and at the same time, we can see uh, the number of people we have in the uh, 16 to 45-year-old age group and uh, how that's going to be shrinking. So I think that over the course of the next month, six weeks, supply could be exceeding demand. And that means we're going to have to work even harder to make that last 20, 25 percent of the population know how important it is that they get vaccinated. Thanks. And then um, specifically for the people who have the five conditions that are eligible for accelerated access, can you talk about the rollout to them or any of the appointments today uh, prioritized for them? Josh? 
Absolutely, yeah, our, our hospitals uh, have done uh, extensive outreach, uh, both through email and outbound phone calling uh, to the people and, you know, in their EHRs uh, with those conditions. I believe some of their physicians have been doing some outreach as well, so that is, uh, that's uh, well underway. And just lastly, Governor, if um, we could get a response to, uh, from you on the revised complaint calling for the feds to overrule your vaccine plan. Who's that complaint to over, overrule that? From the uh, from the disability rights group that who filed the complaint against your vaccine plan. Yeah. Well, as you know, we're going to go um, prioritize the IDD community, others who are most at risk. We've opened up our uh, vaccination to all age groups at this point. As Josh has explained, uh, hospitals and ourselves doing extraordinary outreach there. So um, if probably the complaint's a little uh, past due. I think we're doing everything we can to make sure everybody gets vaccinated with a priority upon those people who are vulnerable. The Hartford Current. Hey everybody, this is Emily Brindley from The Current. Uh, first thing I wanted to ask about, do we have those, uh, those SVI targets, the equity targets for this past week? Yes, so for the past week, as I think we mentioned before, the target actually went up from 25 to 26% when we opened up to 45 and above uh, two weeks ago now, I guess it was. Um, last week, we did 24% of our vaccines to people who lived in those um, 50 high SBI zip codes. Um, this week, we improved another point, uh, so up to 25% of the vaccines administered last week were to people in those high SBI zip codes. So still not quite at the target, but um, ticking upwards and appreciate all the efforts our providers are making to do even more to uh, provide access to uh, people who are living in those under-vaccinated communities. And what is the new goal now that vaccinations are open to everyone 16 and older? So as we open to everyone 16 and older, the, the target will uh, for next week go from 26% up to 31%. Okay, okay thank you. Um, and then Governor, I also wanted to ask you about um, some reopening stuff because we are tomorrow, the state is going to see an, another step of reopening. And obviously the state's numbers over the past week and a half or so have been um, a little bit concerning, as some medical experts have said. I know that hospitalizations dropped today, but then positivity went up a bit today. So as we are looking at this next step of reopening and then potentially more reopening in the future, what what would the metrics have to show you in order for you to either delay the next steps of reopening or to roll back what has already been reopened? Um, again, Emily, I'd say uh, hospital capacity. If I thought that we were uh, at any risk there, that we'd take a second look. but. As I look at the greater Northeast region, I see, um, as I said before, I, um, high positivity in some places that only have 50% capacity. I see high positivity in places that um, have, um, you know, mandates. Uh, high positivity in places where you still have to, uh, you know, everybody has to wear the mask. So I think there's some greater factors here at work going on. So I would do anything I could if I thought it was going to make a difference. Right now, I think we're on a good track, and I think we're going to keep our hospital capacity. And so just to clarify there, um, you're saying that you wouldn't roll back or slow down reopening unless the hospitals were not, were, um, were, didn't have much capacity left, but that would be almost like a, a doubling, maybe even a tripling of what the hospitalizations are right now. So, so you're saying that you wouldn't consider delaying or, or rolling back unless hospitalizations doubled or well, I, I wouldn't be absolute about this. If we saw a sudden shift, we saw a variant, we saw um, Pfizer was not working against the Brazilian variant, which was uh, on fire down in New York, um, you're right, we would get ahead of that curve. But I don't see any of that right now, and I do see incredible progress on our vaccinations, so I think we're ahead of those risks. And one last question. Uh, I know that Hugh asked about state offices reopening, but just kind of in general when we're talking about reopening, what's, uh, what's next up? What's next on the list? Uh, next on the list in terms of um, more broad reopening, um, look, we're sitting down with the uh, legislative leaders. We're going over the list of all of our executive orders. I think it's time for them to weigh in. They may have a point of view on, um, you know, uh, Anything else that ought to open? Right now our bars are still closed, for example. Uh, should we think about doing something outside at some point in the future? Um, I'm pretty strict about masks. I'd like to think we're going to keep that in place a little bit longer. But those are all areas where the legislature may want to have a point of view. So the next step of reopening is TBD at this point? 
I think that's right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Connecticut Public Media. Good afternoon. With uh, this next stage of the vaccine rollout, wondering if um, there are any regional differences, some border town differences, areas of the state where we've seen more people register or um, more people not be able to get vaccines. What has the feedback been? Well, I'll start. When I look at the positivity, as I said before, I, I can still see a little higher along that Metro North corridor, um, not dissimilar to what we saw a year ago. Uh, so I think that's where you have the highest positivity, and that's where we're still doing a lot of testing. Vaccinations are pretty universal around the state. Is that right, Josh? Yeah, we, we've built out, uh, I think, very robust coverage across the state at this point, uh, across you know our, our hospital partners, our federally qualified health centers. You know, we now have hundreds of pharmacy, retail pharmacy locations that are online doing vaccinations, um, and. Uh, uh, so, yeah, we have we have very good coverage for vaccines. I haven't heard any stories about specific parts of the state uh, being underserved at this point, uh, but it's something we watch very carefully. And uh, as you do watch these things, um, if you notice that, like, Fairfield County, oh, there's a lot of demand, um, but uh, in, it started to dwindle in the northern parts of the state, would you allocate more vaccines to this area? Is that something you have planned within the next few weeks to just the amount of vaccines a little bit differently? It's certainly something we're constantly looking at, uh, absolutely. Um, and we'll also have some additional flexibility built in now with all, the, all of the mobile capacity we have, both with the FEMA mobile unit as well as the 35 additional mobile vans um, in the partnership with Griffin Hospital. Um, so those, can, those are also resources that can be deployed, you know, where there's uh, pockets of, uh, uh, that need, need more vaccine delivered quickly. Thank you. The Waterbury Republican American. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Max. Sorry about that. Um, uh, maybe Governor or or Josh could answer this. When when do you guys anticipate that um, state officials be in a position to gauge the the ramifications of this uh, J and J uh, mishap on uh, the vaccination schedule? Josh. Uh, well, Commissioner Gifford and I were on a call with some White House uh, officials earlier today. Not a lot of details that they had to share just yet. It sounds like they're, they're sorting through it a little bit right now as well. But they did give us a lot of confidence, as the governor shared earlier, that uh, the very significant increase in Johnson & Johnson vaccine that we had expected for next week is still on track. So that's great news. Uh, beyond that, we're going to need to wait for a little bit more guidance from them. They made it sound like it, it, it should still, we should still see significant volume of Johnson & Johnson in the, in the rest of April as well. Okay, and, and how much are you expect? how much are we expecting next week? Uh, we don't have a complete total yet. The allocation through the uh, HRSA to the uh, federal uh, FQHC program typically comes in on Friday, so we don't have complete visibility to that yet. We do know for the state allocation, um, we're going up from 120,000 doses to 142,000 doses next week, so that's a great start. We don't have final numbers on the federal pharmacy program yet either, but we expect that also to increase. Um, so, you know, it looks, looks like next week should be a, a, another record week in terms of the number of first doses uh, coming into Connecticut, which is great news. And, and the governor mentioned earlier this morning something about maybe an increase in Pfizer doses next week. Anything on that? Uh, don't, don't believe uh, we're not anticipating an increase in Pfizer doses next week. Okay. Um, uh, governor, you, you mentioned earlier that um, you would thought uh, that private businesses would take care of this issue of uh, verifying testing and, and um, vaccination status. Uh, would you entertain any kind of state prohibition, uh, basically blocking businesses from asking uh, customers about their, uh, when the last time they tested or, uh, or test results or uh, vaccination status? Yeah, I don't know, Paul. I mean, my inclination right now is that perhaps government should stay out of it. Um, but that said, um, I'll sit down with the legislature. I mean, if uh, if you're a restaurateur, perhaps uh, they'd like to make sure that um, all of their staff is vaccinated so the customers feel more comfortable coming in. And if you don't feel um, comfortable getting vaccinated, maybe uh, you, you wear the mask a little longer or only be outside. So 
I, I think I'm going to let this get led by the private and not-for-profit sector for now and uh, wait for guidance from the federal government. And um, is, is it, are we still the sort of operational estimate for the 16 to 44-year-olds? It's still 600,000? Has that, has that changed at all since uh, I think we last uh, heard that estimate? No, the, the projections for where we ended up today as we shift phases was pretty much spot on. Okay, and uh, um, I guess one final question, uh, or ask you guys just to comment on it. Uh, the Department of Education uh, issued a, a report yesterday that said, uh, I believe uh, March or the, or the last week uh, was the highest uh, uh, percentage of in-person learning uh, in Connecticut, uh, I guess, since uh, uh, a year ago in March, and uh, just uh, wondered if you had any thoughts on that development. I think it's great news. I, um, uh, our schools have been open since September. I know what an extraordinary difference that made. Um, our teachers have all been vaccinated. All our educators uh, at least had the opportunity for that first uh, vaccination shot. And Paul, the only thing um, I'm trying to get folks to do is we still have a number of uh, students who are reluctant to go back into the classroom. So we have students calling their friends saying it's safe to come back. We have teachers calling their students saying, come on back, we miss you. And um, I'd like to think uh, sometime over the next month or so, our schools will just be humming. All right, I guess that, I said that was the last question, but I'll, I'll, I'll tee one up for you. Uh, there's a, a basketball game, I think, coming up pretty soon that uh, might be of interest to, to Connecticut. Uh, your thoughts? Look, I'm 100% all in. I'm a homer. Paul, why don't you take this one? Oh, wow. Thanks, Governor. Well, as we all know, the UConn women's basketball team is made to the Final Four. And as everyone else know, uh, the governor is the president of the Board of Trustees. And it is in statute that he will be rooting for the UConn women Huskies. Uh, to not only win this next game against Arizona, but to win the whole thing. And so uh, we will be rooting for the Huskies. Uh, we all bleed blue here in the Capitol in the state of Connecticut. Is that good enough, Governor? Not bad. Not bad. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. Take it easy. The Day of New London. Hello, Governor. Um, let me ask whether uh, there is still any concern about a lingering um, hesitancy uh, regarding the, the uh, vaccinations and have the 75 and older and the 65 and older groups, have they pretty much maxed out? Are you still directing messaging towards them or are, are there other groups uh, that you're concerned about and, and you need to focus uh, the messaging on at this point? A little early to say, uh, Brian, but I can tell you 81% um, of the folks 65 and above um, uh, it's slowed down, no question, but 81% is pretty good. You maybe remember when we brought the vaccines to the nurses at the nursing homes and the hospitals, the first pass was maybe only 33%. Then the next pass, we got up to 66%. So I like to think that um, as you have a friend who got vaccinated and they tell you how liberating it, it, it is and how they didn't have any side effects and how they feel a little more confident going about their day, um, that number will get up over 90%. That's my hope. Okay. Thank you. The Connecticut Mirror. Hi. Um, you guys have noted that uh, hospitalizations among older folks have been trending down. Do you have any data as to whether or not that has held in areas like New Haven where the B117 variant has been found to be prevalent? You want that, Josh? Yeah. Actually, I think uh, the Yale New Haven Hospital System shared data earlier in the week that showed their more recent hospital admissions broken down by age. And what, what you could see very clearly in their data were um, significant, frankly, dramatic declines in hospitalizations of, of people uh, of older ages. Um, and so the percentage and sim similar levels of hospitalization, people at younger ages and some age categories, actually a slight uptick. Um, consistent with the level of infection we're seeing, cases we're seeing among younger people. So um, it's a very important reminder to younger people um, that you can still get very sick from COVID and you need to take it seriously and you need to wear masks when you're around other people. Um, but fortunately, those trends with regards to older people where we have these very high vaccination rates and we have increasing evidence um, that these vaccines are incredibly effective, not just at preventing severe illness, but completely in uh, preventing infection to begin with um, is, is holding firm there. 
Well, so earlier in the pandemic, you know, the pattern was hospitalizations lagged, uh, increasing cases and deaths lagged hospitalizations. Um, so what's the current thinking uh, about, you know, you, the governor noted earlier, Connecticut is still very low in per capita deaths, but given that hospitalizations and, you know, are not, they're, they're, they're better, but they're not, um, they're not as low as they were in the summer and cases are higher. Um, what is the current thinking about what to expect um, regarding, again, this cascade of cases to hospitalizations and ultimately to deaths? Well, the, the time lag that we typically have experienced over the last year and the relationship between those metrics that you're describing, Paz, um, you know, we, we would have seen that by now starting to pick back up in the form of more hospitalizations and more deaths of people of older ages, and we're not. And um, I, I think, you know, every public health expert that, that we've been speaking to uh, says that that's what you would expect, right? If the vaccines work as well as advertised, that's exactly what you would expect to see, and we're seeing it. So that's the great news that we've been hoping for. You can see it in the nursing home data. You know, we've had a grand total of five nursing home deaths in the last month, five in an entire month. So, you know, there's evidence all around us right now of how effective these vaccines are at, at breaking that relationship that you described. And when we look at the history of people who have tested positive, um, does the state have uh, an estimate of what's the amount of natural immunity out there? And then when you put it together with the vaccinated population, you know, do you have now any kind of a sense of what does immunity in Connecticut look like at this point? So there, there is not great data on how many people in Connecticut or anywhere else have had um, COVID infections to this point, as everyone knows, uh, a year ago when COVID was at its worst, there's very little testing available. So the best people can do is make estimates about how many people have had prior infection. And I've seen estimates that vary a lot. Um, so I think the most important thing is that we're focused on getting everybody vaccinated. And, and once we do that, we have a high, high degree of confidence that we'll be able to get COVID behind us. Thank you all. All right, I'm getting my signal here. Um, let me just say something. Uh, a year ago was April Fool's Day as well. And a year ago, we were fools when it came to uh, COVID. And uh, there was hydroxychloroquine and just Lysol and masks uh, don't work. But I want to leave on a positive note. You know, uh, 240 days later, Pfizer came out with a vaccine, mRNA, and then J&J &J and Moderna that work and are extraordinarily flexible and work against the most complicated variants. And here we are one year since April Fool's Day a year ago, and we've got uh, about 40 percent of our population vaccinated with something that really works. And uh, I think it's a testament to maybe it takes us a while to get going. When we get going, our biopharma system, our scientists are amazing what they've been able to do. But it only works if you get vaccinated. That's what the message was here today. We're making extraordinary progress. And um, we're going to win. And the UConn women are going to win. Thanks, everybody.